you probably will not necessarily know where you're going if you yeah. don't know where you come from, right? Because where you come from already has a, a toolkit that you actually need to move around the world and be more successful and prosper. Hi, my name is Orlando and you're listening to Cooking Back to Our Roots with my mom, Vivian Aqua, the DE. I consulted at Amplify DEI. My mom will be talking to different guest speakers from the African diaspora in the Netherlands. The podcast is not just about food, but also about connecting the conversation with our roots and cultivating a deeper appreciation for our shared heritage. Welcome to the Cooking Back to Our Roots podcast, Katakani. And I'm curious about who you are and what you do. So do you mind sharing that with the audience? Yes. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm really interested in engaging in this uh, conversation. So just a bit about myself. Mm-hmm. My name is Katakani Mabasar. I was uh, born and raised in South Africa. And actually, I was born in uh, 1990, which is the same year that Mandela got out of prison, Ooh. right? So one interesting fact about yeah. me is that actually the only person in my family that doesn't have an English name. So every person in my family has like either like their first name or a middle name that is actually English or European, but I'm the only person that have just one name. And uh, it just goes to sort of just the importance of what 1990 was in South Africa, because for my family, they all sort of paused and go, okay, we're just going to have this one who will not necessarily need an English name to move in the world Mm -hmm. because there's the new South Africa that's coming. There's a new world that's actually coming. So it's quite a a very interesting uh, fact, but also that the name itself, like Katekani, just means be blessed or get blessed. So there's a sense of, you know, that a generational hope towards just, you know, the kind of life that I was expected to live based on what was happening in South Africa in the year that Mm -hmm. I was born. So that's pretty much a bit about myself. And uh, I'm a finance professional in terms of my day job, currently the global M&A finance lead in a health tech uh, multinational. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to decipher a few things because you are just dropping a lot of gems like it's nothing. So first of all, thank you for sharing, for educating us about the year that you were born and also how pivotal it was. But also, Hmm. can you say something about your parents giving your siblings English names? Mm -hmm. Can you yeah, can you share something about that? I mean, I used to complain, right, as a child, if I'm being honest, right, because I didn't really understand why I had to be different. Yeah. Right. So I remember when I was like 14, also just in school, right, most of my mm-hmm. friends had English names. My best friend yeah. was Nancy and mm-hmm. everyone else just literally had that and they can just use it at their disposal. Mm -hmm. Or else with myself, I didn't have it. So I remember having this conversation or trying to have this conversation with my parents. And I I said to my dad, I I want an English name, right? And I want an English name. I don't have one and I don't understand. And I remember my dad actually saying to me, you can actually give yourself an English name once you turn 18, because then legally you are then allowed to actually do that. I was like, okay, great. I picked up a few uh, names from from my friends and from like even TV shows as well. So there were actors that I'm like, oh yeah, I love that name. I want that name for myself. And when I turned 18, I was actually now already in university. And I realized that my name was actually good because I could connect with people of a similar heritage, right? So someone who's Tsonga can actually say, oh yeah, you are Tsonga, where do you come from? Are you from this part of the world? Someone who's Zulu already can recognize that, oh, you are actually part of, you know, this tribe. So it already starts conversations and you easily make friends just keeping your 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 heritage name. So in that sense, so I, I saw it was beneficial. So I forgot about my plan to actually add an English name. And when I entered the corporate world, quite interestingly, my first manager really loved my name. She's like, oh, Katakani, oh, such a lovely name. Right. And we were actually talking about it because she's African-American. So she just spoke about just how amazing African names are. And when I saw it from her perspective, Mm -hmm. I realized that there's actually power 
in having a heritage name and actually moving with that around the world, right? So yeah. I was like the only Katikani in my company at the time. Yeah. Still the only Katikani even in the company that I work for at the moment. And it's such a unique name because only I have it, but also everywhere I go because I've had the privilege of traveling and, and living and working abroad. This is literally the fifth time I'm actually working outside of South Africa. I've lived in Lagos, I've lived in Kenya, in the US, in the UK, and everywhere I go, Whenever I meet Africans, someone can instantly connect with the name, yeah. with the yeah. side name. Like uh, the Zimbabwe folks that I always meet, Abasa is actually one of the common surnames in Zimbabwe. So they're like, hey, mm-hmm. are you one of us. Yeah. Right? So it, yeah. just, it just makes it so easy for me to build community, right? That I ended up seeing the perspectives that my parents actually were seeing and that it actually also gives me this license to be more authentic. Yeah. Because I don't have this leeway to sort of hide. What? The moment I say Katikani, it it just, it means something to anyone in the world. And as such, yeah, that has been the experience. So I've given you a long explanation, but I just want... No, I love it. I love the explanation <laughs> because while, yeah. Yeah, while you were, were talking about it and talking about the importance of us having our original name and also... Tying it into our identity. I was thinking about Uzo Aduba, right? The one from Orange is the New Black, where there is a viral video, which I will share with the podcast that where she was talking about that in the beginning, when she was younger, she wanted to change her name into an English name, right? Like Zoe. Yes. Her full name is Uzo Amuka, Am- Amaka. And her mom, she's Nigerian. Let's say that black moms, black parents, they have a way of saying things. And also was mimicking her mom, like, why do you want to change your name? And her mom definitely gave the sharp answer in saying like, if they can learn to say Dostoevsky, Chaisjovsky and Michelangelo, they can all learn to say Uzo Amaka. She made it simple and she made it, she made her wear her name with pride. And there's so much more into going to say that with LinkedIn now, you have the opportunity to learn how to pronounce somebody's name. So let's stop. Let's stop with the mispronouncing. So people, you're listening. I'll make sure to add a link into how you can learn how to learn how to pronounce somebody else's name. But also people who are listening to this podcast who, let's say they have a name that is not common or they have a name that is misspelled often help people out and activate this this feature from LinkedIn so yes. that you help people pronounce your name better. That's that's it. So oh, your yes. answer was spot on, period. It was spot on, period. So oh, yeah. going back, I know you've mentioned a couple of times that you are South African, but what is it that you want people to know about South Africa as in the different version of how the media is portraying South Africa? So what should people know? Yeah, I mean, South Africa has not really had the best reputation in the past. Mm -hmm. There's always a lot happening in South Africa. But the one thing I want people to know about South Africa is that all South Africans are actually fully committed to collaborating with other Africans and to actually be part of the transformation that needs to happen in Africa, right? We always see sort of South Africa as a center point around different, you know, struggles uh, with uh, our brothers and sisters from either Nigeria or or Ghana or wherever. And Mm -hmm. that sort of, it it creates this picture that actually, you know, also Africans, like we have this, 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 this thinking, right, that we don't like our brothers and sisters or we don't actually want to work with them. We do like them. The only thing is that we have a you know, a soft war when it comes to who has the best food, who has the best <laughs> love. But from my perspective, though, there is a lot of love, much more love among African countries yes. than within Europe- European countries. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. And most of us, like we really strive to actually have that as uh, the perception, because every time I move around the world and I'm like, oh, I'm South African, the first thing another African in most times yeah. We'll talk about is the incidents that would have happened with either a cousin or a friend and and sort of like just creates that that narrative, right? So mm-hmm. yeah. we should be a lot more careful about just the propaganda and who actually benefits from it, 
right? So mm-hmm. if we are all seeing all of that, who actually benefits from South Africa being portrayed as a country that doesn't really like other Africans, yeah. right? Because yeah. this actually defeats or it, it doesn't really help our efforts to actually work together and create this one Africa where we can all strive together and actually mm-hmm. enrich Africa. And because there's no way one country in Africa can do it on its own. If we look at sort of Europe, right? Europe has scale, right? Yeah. China has scale. India mm-hmm. has scale, yeah, right? Africa on its own also needs to build that scale. But when mm-hmm. we still have these things that are happening, right, it just sort of now, you know, it takes us backwards in terms of just the development. So I think that's very, very important for, for people. To, and also another thing is just around how young South Africa's democracy is. And that, you know, South Africa is still working through quite a lot of things post-apartheid to build its identity, to, to build its, its ability to, to, to have this rainbow nation that we always talk about yeah. more, more effective, right? And yeah. that takes time because, you know, people can't necessarily expect a country that was colonized for hundreds of years to actually just overnight in 30 years, right? And that's how young our de- democracy is. It's actually 30 years. Right. Yeah. To actually now get it right. We are still working through all of that. And uh, and yeah, there's a lot of great progress that's being made. And also that I think the future for South Africa is a lot bright, but it, it will be most likely brighter if we are able to work with uh, other African countries as well. I love that. And why did you say yes to me interviewing you for the Cooking Back to Our Roots podcast? Because this is the first time that we are meeting We are seeing each other. We have had some interactions via LinkedIn and via the WhatsApp. But what made you say yes? I think, you know, roots are so important, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because, you know, there's this saying that you probably will not necessarily know where you're going if you don't know where you come from, right? Because where you come from already has a, a toolkit that you actually need to move around the world and be more successful and prosper. And in most times we are trying to shape our identities based on what we see in the Western world, yeah. right? And never really enough about the great strengths that actually comes from our roots and our mm-hmm. ancestry. Like yeah. uh, when I was actually sort of preparing to come to this show, when you mentioned the word roots, right? It got me intrigued to research about my roots, mm-hmm. right? Or to say, okay, yeah. What are actually my roots? So I had a mm-hmm. conversation with my dad about it and he said things that really for me, I felt I should have known a bit more sooner mm-hmm. than, than now. And actually our original roots before South Africa, right? My dad, myself, we were both born in South Africa, but my late grandfather was actually mm-hmm. from Mozambique. So mm-hmm. my roots actually goes back to Mozambique. So we actually come from one of the royal houses in Mozambique. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now we are talking, I mean, you're talking, I'm talking to royalty and you're talking to royalty because my, my grandmother was royalty as well. So we are ancestors for royalty, right? We're royalty, right? <laughs> and, and when you're royalty yeah, and you come from, from that bloodline, that yeah. worship is already in your, in yeah. your uh, making, right? Yeah. It's already in your DNA, right? Mm-hmm. The ability to to build communities, right? Yeah. It's already within you. Your ability to to do quite a lot of things and also just the pride of it, right? Mm-hmm. Just feel more proud that, oh, I come from a family of royalty, a family that actually built things. Like actually my family has a village in South Africa that is named the same name as the one that's in Mozambique. So they were mm-hmm. able to build a kingdom in yeah. South Africa as well are similar mm-hmm. to Mozambique. And I look at it, I'm like, wow, this this are really great heritage to know and to, yeah. and to be proud of because today I can actually look at that and be a lot more proud about my abilities mm-hmm. uh, to lead, uh, to build communities, to work with others, to actually do great things. And also to- and These are the stories that we need to share with each other because now that you have, now that we are having this conversation, I hope that the 
whole world finds out about your heritage and your royalty ness by, but also these are the things that in the past were, let's say, erased yes. from, you know, yes. from the colonial slavery past where there's so much more to us. But because of this erasure, we don't know a lot about us or we have to figure out the pieces ourselves, which is challenging. But by sharing these stories and putting us together, right, a Ghanaian with a South African having a conversation about our roots, we have African roots. We are from the African diaspora and there's so yes. much to us that is more common, more mm-hmm. the same that I want us to connect with us, but I also want to find the the differences between us so that we can learn from each other and and amplify that as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So having this conversation that we're Mm -hmm. having is so powerful and that is why I wanted to to come onto the podcast and actually Mm -hmm. uh, talk to you about it because also I've learned that as Africans, we are more connected than we actually think. So you might grow up thinking, oh yeah, I'm just South African. But in reality, your heritage can go all the way up to East Africa, like on my mom's side, right? Like Mm -hmm. I also looked at my mom's history as well. So Mm -hmm. same royalty. And then so sort of like coming from the likes of like your your East Africa and people Mm -hmm. typically said I look more East Africa, Mm -hmm. (laughs) East African than South African. And then now Mm -hmm. the puzzle was like, oh yeah, it's probably- Now you understand it. Yeah. Now I understand it. And it's just- it just echoes what I was talking about in terms of the need for Africans to come together because we are actually far more connected than we actually think. So where we are born is not the end state of our heritage. It could actually be sort of just like, like uh, it's not the end state. Your your heritage might have started somewhere else in Africa, right? Mm-hmm. And just learning more about that actually gets you to connect more with other Africans yeah. as well and see the need for us to all come together, not just as people, but also as a continent. I love that. And what is the favorite meal that you want to share with the listeners? What's, what, what is the name of it? And what are the ingredients or the main ingredients of that meal? Yeah, I mean, I love any meal that has a pop in it. Uh, so mm-hmm. those that don't know, don't know what pop is, it's a mm-hmm. main meal. Mm-hmm. Um, so like some pulp with stew, either beef stew mm-hmm. or chicken stew with some vegetables in it, uh, such as uh, like uh, spinach, mm-hmm. which is really uh, common in South Africa. Mm-hmm. So I really like those kind of like meals. Uh, sometimes mm-hmm. you can also have pulp with like mopanu worms as well, mm-hmm. uh, which I really enjoy fried, really like crispy. So yeah, those are like my <laughs> favorites are African meals. <laughs> It's very challenging for me to to just have this conversation. And in my mind, I'm seeing all these people go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now I'm uh, getting hungry just thinking about this delicious uh, meals. <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome. And what did you learn from the sneak preview that you watched? Oh, that was a very powerful episode with mm-hmm. uh, Kobe and uh, Benedicta, there's like three things that I took out Mm -hmm. uh, from that episode. The Mm -hmm. first one is the relationship between Ghana and Suriname. Yeah. Right. And and I just love how the peanut soup actually connects it, right? Because you mentioned that the peanut soup that is prepared in Suriname is actually very similar to how your mother, your grandmother used to prepare it. Mm -hmm. And that is so powerful because as much as we had the slave trade happen, it seems that all that heritage was what was actually preserved. And that's yeah. very powerful to actually learn mm-hmm. about just that history and just the ability to still sort of connect with people from African descent through our food. So that's yeah. really, for me, one of the first most important lessons I learned from that episode And the second one is just the love of African parents when it comes to education. Yeah. Like, like, I think you all sort of like resonated with that and I equally resonate with that as well. Like growing up, school was Mm -hmm. not like an option. It was mandatory. Getting great grades uh, was very, very important. And, Mm -hmm. you know, our African parents believed it as a toolkit, right? Knowledge as a toolkit. Mm -hmm 
to get us to strive in the world. And I think it is so powerful that we all have that, right? So for me, getting my degree and my master's and everything was something that was very, very important to my parents. And I remember as a teenager, I just didn't really like it, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, we don't have an option. We don't yes. have an option <laughs> because our parents don't play. And even I, myself at the moment right now, I do want to instill that and pass it on to my son. I'm just saying like, okay, there is, you know, there is a minimum that I want him to achieve, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I don't want him to slack. I don't want him to slack because I know that he can become bigger. He's, he's a great boy at the moment right now, but sometimes he is inspired and he isn't inspired. And I want to be that cheerleader ambassador for him to not give up that easily. Yeah. And it also reminds me of something Douglas, Frederick Douglass actually mm. said, right? Yeah. That knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Yeah. So could it be that there was a connection that our yeah. parents already had that having knowledge is actually going to make you super unfit to be a slave? And yeah. as such, you will actually most likely enjoy your freedom, yeah. right? Freedom to do what you want to do. Uh, without actually having to struggle so much in, in, in yeah. life. So when I connect these two things, I find that very powerful and, and, and it just goes hand in hand with our freedom, right? So yeah. just having freedom without sort of the knowledge, it can be a bit of a, a struggle, right? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I do yeah, now. But you, you are a living example of what, knowledge how powerful knowledge knowledge can bring you to different places to yes. different places of the world yes you ended up in the Netherlands of all the ways where I'm thinking like South Africa is also warm and you ended up in the Netherlands but that's a whole lot of conversation <laughs> yeah we'll discuss that separately <laughs> but yes you're so right yeah. yeah indeed like when I was in in high school I mm -hmm. never imagined that my career will take me where I am right now yeah. Like, wow, I would leave abroad. I will have this really great corporate roles. You know, I, I never really imagined it, that it was actually possible. But through knowledge and dead, anything was just possible. Like I can think about doing something right now and start sort of executing with mm -hmm. knowledge that I have built in the past and the knowledge that I'm still continuing to build. So indeed, you know, you can't, you can't be a slave when you have a sense of knowledge and also you have the ability to execute all that knowledge. So, so there could be sort of something very powerful that Frederick was trying to get us to see as well. And, and maybe our parents saw that way before we did. And, mm -hmm. and for me, I'm just seeing that relationship now. Yeah. Yeah. Knowledge can open doors, but I, I also feel like it's valuable to connect with people with common people with like-minded people and also to reach out right relationship See. building relationship is really a currency that is missed and we can connect with so many people when we speak a similar language or where we understand each other or just connect because we have a similarity so to disclose a good friend of mine a good friend of Katakani connected us Nancy and she connected with me with Katakane because of the fact that I was talking about this podcast that I'm doing, Cook It Back to Our Roots. And then Nancy shared like, you really should talk to Katakane because South Africa is not being discussed. And I was confronted with my own blind spot within the whole Dutch slavery pass apology done by the Dutch King Willem Alexander. So Let's dive into this topic because yeah. I want to connect it to your past. So let's dive into first your past. How was it for you growing up and knowing now what, what the Dutch King recently has done? I'm asking a lot of questions. So let's start with how was it for you? How do you look back to your past? Yeah. So for me, I was born in 1990. Uh, mm -hmm. which is the same year Mandela uh, got out of a prison. And two, three years after uh, the ANC came into power and as such, the Blacks were now ruling South Africa. And 
for me, I never really sort of had the experience of what apartheid was and what it looked like. I grew up mm-hmm. also in Lipopo, which is very sort of disconnected from sort of like your your housing, which is like your way where Soweto is, right? Where mm-hmm. the, the 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 challenges were, uh, mm-hmm. and visibly so, uh, mm-hmm. all the different challenges that were in the country. So for me, my experience in terms of just the segregation didn't really kick in until corporate, right? Because also I went to University of Johannesburg and I picked Mm -hmm. a Soweto campus, which was predominantly black, right? So we would have a few white people. And I remember reflecting with my friend about that. And he was like, well, the fact that they used to send a lot of black people to this particular campus could be that there was a sense of continuation around apartheid. Like, have Mm -hmm. we ever looked at that, Mm -hmm. right? And we had a very long conversation about that. But for us, because we didn't really have sort of like a very uh, close relationship with sort of the division, we we just carried on with what we needed to do in university. And when I entered corporate, I began to see the dynamics play out, right? That... Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, black people are not necessarily represented in high power structures, right? In senior positions. And also there was the push around black employee employment empowerment, of a black economic em- empowerment. Uh, they actually keep revising this BE word uh, that you just lose touch in terms of what it means because now they also made it broad based uh, black economic empowerment, right? Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. meant to basically ensure that Black people are able to get positions in in senior positions in in companies because when apartheid ended, it never necessarily instantly triggered different races to come together. So there was still that division. And even today, that division still exists Mm -hmm. and there is less effort to organically get it to actually no longer exist, right? So people still want to keep living the way they're living are in their own segregated communities as well. Because even so, like that's what apartheid did, right? It it created Mm -hmm. sort of separate development. So if you go to, depending on where you are in South Africa, you will actually see that, right? Like you can go to a predominantly black community and then 10 minutes out, five minutes out, you're in a predominantly white community as well. Mm -hmm. So there's, there was all these things that I began to sort of see and realize that, okay, we still have a lot of that, that history when mm-hmm. it comes to apartheid and that, mm-hmm. you know, there isn't really that, that sense of, okay, it's all in the past and let's just all unite. There's still... But the past isn't, isn't that far away, right? You just mentioned that it's 30 years ago that yeah, the change yeah, exactly. was happened. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that residue indeed, it's still... Mm-hmm. There. So when the king actually visited, right, he yeah. reminded us mm-hmm. of that past. Yeah. He reminded us and, and and as such, people were sort of like still, you know, angry about what, what happened with their lands as well, being mm-hmm. forcefully removed from their lands. And yeah. also that there hasn't been a lot of transformation to restructure the country in a way that mm-hmm. that quality is actually achieved. Yeah. So, so what I saw with, with, with just how he was received, an apology is great. I think we, we respect that a lot about him. Mm-hmm. And we think, you know, it's, it's the start of what needs to happen next because things yeah. are not going to organically happen. So how does mm-hmm. the Netherlands partner with South Africa to rebalance the inequalities? Because Africa is actually one of the most unequal countries in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. We have 8% uh, minorities holding 90% of the country's wealth, Mm -hmm. right? There's there's really sort of like that dynamic today, not 30 years ago, today, right? So there's a lot of efforts that are needed to fix the country. And that Mm -hmm. will require our Mm ex-colonizers to play a role, given that they did play a role in the actual creation of 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 this picture, even yeah. if it's not him directly, it's, you know, which we fully understand. But since we are all living in this generation, how do we come mm-hmm. together 
uh, to yeah. fix the, the 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 challenges and restore also the pride uh, that Black people. Uh, need to have in their own countries as well, because, yeah. you know, apartheid didn't just take away our wealth or our ability to build wealth, but it also took away our pride, yeah. our Your identity, crowd, yeah. our identity yeah. as black yeah. people. So well, how do we get that back? It, it all just comes with all the different efforts that are expected from the different individuals uh, to ensure that we do move forward, because I can yeah. also see this a bit living in the Netherlands, right? And that's why, that's also one of the reasons why I wanted to address something with this season of Cooking Back to Our Roots, where the Dutch focus and the apologies and the recognition regarding the hurt, Mm. it tends to only go to Suriname and to the Dutch Antilles, where I'm just like, whoa, wait a minute. They had their roots somewhere else before you stole them. Yes. You need to also talk about, you know, West Africa. You need to also talk about South Africa. In my blind spot, I forgot South Africa. And that's why I'm bringing you here to make my wrong right. But also to educate other people that the Dutch had so much more involvement within Africa. That we need to also acknowledge that within the apology and also in the restoration, reparation conversation that we are having in the future. And exactly. false apology is good, but there needs to be a comma for the next step as well. Exactly, exactly. Because the place that the king actually went, yeah. uh, the slave lodge, it was yeah. actually used as, as, a, as a location to mm-hmm. store slaves that were being taken from India, from Indonesia, yeah. from yeah. all these places, right? So indeed yeah. that slavery element uh, uh, you know, it, it's there. It's it's right there in in Cape Town, and you can actually see those monumental places and locations. Yes. And then we also got sort of the sophisticated side of 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 that whole slavery, and that is apartheid. Yeah. So, and it, it's a very very sensitive topic, and we understand that you know the amount of challenges that. Mm -hmm. Uh, occurred in South Africa and across Africa as well as a result Mm -hmm. of what the the Dutch did will Mm -hmm. take years to restore. However, we are open to those conversations. We are open to the reparation process, right? Because indeed the reparations are not only going to your Surinamese and, and all the other known sort of direct places when it comes to slavery, but also the likes of South Africa where they literally practice uh, apartheid with uh, as a joint force as well with uh, with uh, the UK right so yes it's it's something that indeed we have to talk about and also just the impact on the people today around our mental health as well mm-hmm. and how we actually uh, move and and operate in the world um, yeah. because you know there are elements such as generational trauma that we never talk about so, yeah, I mean, we can <laughs> talk about the effects of, of slavery and apartheid throughout, but I'm just demonstrating that it didn't, it didn't just sort of, you know, affect our ability to build wealth, but it also affected our, our trauma, our well-being, our yeah. well-being right? And, and also just our confidence and, and, and our history as well. So there's mm-hmm. so much that was taken from us. And we do need that acknowledged, but also that not just the king himself apologizing, but also how does he educate his community uh, Mm -hmm. around this in particular? And Mm -hmm. also just how they should treat people of, you know, African descent in light of what has uh, transpired in the past. I do. I do want to acknowledge that. The Dutch king is the first of the royals that acknowledges, which is making the Netherlands the first of making an effort. I'm saying making an effort. Yes. To, first of all, apologize. Second of all, they are doing research, which I'm, I'm just like, okay, good that you're doing research, but we need something in place to prevent what has happened in the past to impact us further in a negative way. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I want to address is that I do find it brave that the king is asking for forgiveness. It's not about apology. It's asking for forgiveness because when he said that, 
it even moved, you know, I, I had some emotions within me that yeah. really shook me like, wow, he's going beyond just the apology. But also when he was in South Africa, I know that the media has a way of portraying things and, and documenting things that are bad. So the Dutch King was in South Africa where he was going through all these past uh, monumental exhibits. Mm. But the thing that was highlighted the most was the confrontation that the Dutch King and Queen had when they were talking about the colonial legacy. And the other thing that I find brave is that he and his wife did pay attention and listen to those who were demonstrating at the time in South Africa. And they could have walked away and run away, but they chose to listen, actively listen and take away what they can do to do better. I don't know what the outcome is, but I do find it brave that this is a, a valuable lesson that they are activating, navigating tough and challenging conversations mm. for a productive outcome. How many it, people in the workplace run away when things are, when these conversations are are going left. How many people are walking away when they need to have these brave conversations? And, and to see them doing this in action, that for me was a valuable lesson that so many other people should also bring back to the workplace as well. And it, I fully agree because yeah. him apologizing is so important and also asking for forgiveness. And it, yeah. it came from a very authentic place. That's also what I sort of perceived from mm-hmm. that apology and the confrontation was really sort of ended a very small portion of his entire trip. Yep. There were events that he actually went to mm-hmm. and had different conversations as well, meeting with also companies, yeah. which is also not necessarily. But that wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't registered in the media. Yeah. yeah. At least it was maybe registered in a minor way, which got the most attention was Yes. The backlash or the, the demonstration that exactly. they were ambushed into leaving a building. And I'm just like, wow, we need to be careful about the way we are reading things. But also we need to be careful about what whose side of the story is being shown. Yes, indeed, indeed. Because the conversations that he has had in South Africa and the different mm-hmm. visits, it demonstrates that indeed he went in to learn, to understand Mm -hmm. the history and to have critical conversations with people in South Africa on on just the the whole experience and how Mm -hmm. we work together. Because if he wasn't really willing to collaborate with South Africa uh, on this uh, legacy, then he wouldn't necessarily do the visit, right? And going to the slave lodge was a very clear indication that he does want to rebuild a different future. So I fully agree with you that, you know, what he did, I mean, some people died without actually ever apologizing. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And every mm-hmm. time we think about them, I mean, <laughs> Speak we're, not, on it. <laughs> we're not going to mention them, but every time we think about them, we yeah. just think about the past. Yeah. Right. And the mm-hmm. brutality around that. And indeed what the Netherlands is doing is very powerful and it should actually be a symbol, right, to every single person, even just, you know, every single in country the in the Europe. Right. Have the conversation country. around, yeah. yeah, diversity, right? Have the conversation around, hey, you know, when we talk about mental health, how are we inclusive in the mental health space, mm-hmm. right? How are we ensuring that there is equity in everything, everything that we're doing? So if we're talking about career opportunities, how are we introducing equity, And not just say, well, we do have positions so everyone can simply apply and simply get promoted when in reality, it's it's not not that easy, right? So yeah, not that simple. (laughs) Fully. We could go, we can go on and on, but I I do want to bring you back to the present. What would you like people to take with them into the present and why? I think the most important thing that I want people to take into the present is just how how powerful our melanin history and speak on it, speak on it, right? (laughs) Speak on it. (laughs) Our history was really sort of erased completely by slavery, by colonization, 
Mm-hmm. But Africans were really, really powerful, right? Yeah. We were actually running functioning kingdoms mm-hmm. that were actually wealthy, that were progressive. And all of that was erased from us. And right now we're trying to adapt to sort of the Western standards and 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 which also it's not really working because we... Mm-hmm. We do have our own ways of working and and our own heritage that was actually effective. So if there's one thing that I want us to take into the present is to basically just reactivate that melanin power that is yeah. already built in us, right? And, and 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 study the past, right? I've been like right now super obsessed with that, right? Yeah. To study and understand the, the the past. And and it has built my confidence so much. Because when I, I read about just the different things that happened in, in Africa and the different uh, uh, leaders, like your, there were queens as well, right? Mm-hmm. That were like running factive mm-hmm. kingdoms and, and fighting as a black woman, I feel so proud, right? Mm-hmm. That as a black woman, my history is not just diminished to being a slave that cleans houses and, and raise other people, people kids. For other, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, for the other race, right? Yeah. That yeah. actually my history is 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 more of 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 just that, right? Of 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 royalty, of 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 of, of striving as well, mm-hmm. of being capable to succeed in, in different spheres and creativity and just everything great. So if we look into the past, we can actually bring in a lot of that today. And be a lot more successful as black people because it's already within us. Our ancestors were really, really powerful before the slavery and, and the colonization that actually destroyed that. And we just need to go back to that because when we do that, we are more confident. You know, we are more successful in what, what, what we're doing because we show up with that confidence that I can be anything I actually want to become. So for me, that's the one thing I uh, I would want everyone to bring into the present. This conversation you're making me you're making it challenging for me to host because what you are saying is just air candy. It's just empowerment. It's just while you were talking about your heritage, but also learning about your roots. There's one song that goes into that is playing in my mind, and that is Beyonce's song, "My Power." my power, Mm. my Mm. power. And it's giving me goosebumps listening to you. And whilst, you know, playing that song in my mind, like this is, this is like an anthem. This is what we need to do. And it, and it warms my heart to be having these conversations. So thank you. And also for the people that don't know Katakani yet, whilst you're listening, if there is a way for, to include her as a speaker, You are already walking away with so much because I'm just like, oh, this woman. Wow. I am. You're making it hard for me to host this show. So (laughs) (laughs) I guess it's a it's a good thing. But I'm really about just being melanin. Right. So, yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Love it. Love it. What is the message that you want to share for the future for to empower others, but also to inspire others to mitigate the challenges that we are facing today? I think the message that I I wanted to bring into the present sort of transcend into the future as well, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Because when we know where we've been, when we know who we are, what we are capable of doing, Yes. Right. Then it's yeah. very easy for us to build on tomorrow. Right. So mm-hmm. as Africans, yeah. we build effective kingdoms. Shouldn't we do that in the future? Right. Shouldn't we build an Africa that is very prosperous, that anyone basically will wish to be African, will mm. wish to basically experience that. Right. And we can actually do that because we are all built within us that ability to actually strive for something like that and go for it. So what I would instill in terms of the message is just be proud of who you are Mm -hmm. and collaborate with others that have the exact same interests that you have around Africa, around Black people, and just us basically are living a very uh, prosperous life because Mm -hmm. the 
a slave is is all in the past and we have all that knowledge that we need that right now makes it makes it impossible for us to go back there as black people so now moving forward is how do we build kingdoms and how do we build technologies how do we build systems that can actually benefit us and our people as well yeah. as the world equally yeah i had a joy a pleasure of having this conversation with you and my mind is like going it's in the it's it's in it's in Disneyland right now like this woman is saying this and then this and then that and then this and for me it was a joy to learn more about your country but also a joy for you to instill so much power and power this generation and the generation beyond so thank you for for this conversation Thank you for having me. I really, really enjoyed having this conversation with you. And mm-hmm. I really admire what you're doing because you are literally creating a platform when, where we can all come together yeah. and inspire each other. So thank you so much for creating this platform. Thank you as well. Until next time. Until next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Cooking Back to Our Roots. I hope you enjoyed my mom's conversation with the guest speakers. If you love what you heard today, don't forget to share this episode with your friends and family. Until next time, bye!